Great. All right. Welcome to part two of class one of painting glowing landscapes. Um, today, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, using a very limited palette, which is one primary color of each of one of these primaries. So you got a yellow, a red, and a blue. Um, this would be a high chroma limited palette. I'm also going to show a low chroma. This is a Zorn palette, which I'm not going to be using today. We will be using that later on in class. Um, and then I'm going to be using the very limited palette, uh, talking about why I use what's called a split primary palette, two yellows, two reds, and two blues, and why I do that. And I'm going to be actually doing quick little paintings to describe it. So we can discuss too, if you guys are willing and uh, want to do color wheels um, with the different colors. This is a CMYK, kind of like your uh, printer would use, um, except for there's no K, there's no black on there. But um, anyways, I really love doing color wheels and can learn a lot, but I also know that they are torture for a lot of people, especially if you've done a number of them in the past. But um, anyways, I'm going to be starting off with a very limited palette. This is a palette that um, I was um, urged to use uh, by an instructor who basically saw that I was laying out, you know, 20 different colors and getting in a lot of trouble and not able to replicate colors, meaning like if I ran out of a color, I would have no way of knowing how I had mixed it and uh, anything else. So who here has used a very limited palette before? One red, one yellow, and one blue, and white. Go ahead and just say yes, because I can't actually see you anymore. Yes. 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 All right. Yes. And what did you think of it? Loved it. Good. All right. Well, then you'll hopefully love today. Um, I find that it was an interesting thing because I was teaching, you know, using the limited palette and uh, making people, making my students do the color wheel and saying you can mix most all colors if you have the right primaries, right? If you have the right yellow, white, right red, and right blue. But the truth is, is you can't, not with oil paints, anyways, is that. Um, you, there's no perfect color. There's no perfect yellow. There's no perfect red. And there's no perfect blue. Like this red actually has quite a bit of yellow in it and wants to lean towards orange. And this blue wants to lean towards purple. It has quite a bit of red in it. So when we mix this bluish, this reddish blue, that ultramarine blue with yellow to make green, <coughs> it inevitably makes a very kind of muted not nearly as bright as when I use a blue that leads towards green. Um, and we'll talk about that more. So anyways, when I was teaching my students in the early years of my teaching to do these color wheels, I always felt kind of like I was lying. Because um, you know the, the purple that you make is hideous. It's this really dark, muddy, kind of a plum color and everything else. But what I did learn from that is that you don't, in fact, need to often create perfect colors that close enough in painting is often close enough and that we can make things appear right even when they're wrong by what colors are around them what values they are and everything else so the first colors i'm going to lay out are ultramarine blue cadmium red medium and for me, it's a Hansa yellow light, but it could be like a Hansa, or it could be a cadmium yellow or yellow light or something. Anyways, it's just one yellow, one red, one blue, and look at how runny that yellow is. And I'm going to do a very limited palette, which you can do. And I've even had students in the past that I've recommended they use just these three colors for quite a long time. If colors are getting too out of hand for you and you're having a hard time, you would be amazed at how much you can do with just these three colors. Also, this is a great set of colors for, let's say, if you're traveling or backpacking and you want to do what's the most I can get with the least amount of tubes of paint, you can really get a lot of uh, 
get a lot done with these. I'm going to be using just Gamsol, which is just the Gamblin's paint thinner. I'm not going to be using any medium today. I'm just kind of speeding it up. And I'm using this kind of, I don't want to say simple, but just a land a sunset landscape. And I'm not going to um, worry too much about, you know, making anything perfect. I'm just going to, I'm looking to the colors more. So let's just put in the horizon line, which is always pretty much always my first line when I'm painting a landscape. It is the most important thing, pretty much. It grounds and gives me a placement of everything else. Michael, uh, is your is your photo reference is it um, blurred or is it? Did you Photoshop that or something? It looks like no. it. No. Okay. It's on the Padlet. You can um, see it on there. I posted it on the Padlet page, so you'll be able to see, kind of. And already I put way too much paint thinner in that first line. So it's very uh, very drippy. So that's why I went with my paper towel and wiped that up a little bit. First thing I want to do and show you using this palette is that um, I can't make exactly black, but I can make an exceptionally dark color that's going to stand in and work as black. I'm going to take about two thirds ultramarine, a touch of the cadmium. The cadmium is very strong, uh, meaning there's a lot of pigment in it compared to these other colors. So that may be too much. I'm going to pull some aside just to see here. Yeah, you can see how strong that is. That was one third cadmium to the three fourths uh, blue, ultramarine blue, and it still is very warm and uh, uh, reddish. So I'm adding more blue. If my pile of color gets too big and unmanageable, and I'm just finding I'm adding more and more and more color, what I'll often do is pull off part of it and set it aside. So now I have a much more manageable mixing pile. Otherwise, sometimes it can become like the blob, where it just keeps needing to be fed. And it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And as you're chasing the right color, you're just going to have to use all your paint to mix it. So oftentimes pulling some of it aside and making it a smaller pile makes it much more manageable. So right now what I have is, um, let's see if I can zoom in a little bit. What I have is a very dark plum color. Um, if I mix a tiny bit of white, I can see it better, kind of where the color is going. A little more white. It's just reading is very dark, but it's a nice kind of a blue dark color. So I'm going to add a little more of this warm pile. I don't want it going too bluish. But the great thing about mixing darks with this palette is I can mix a warmer dark or a cooler dark just by simply adding a little more red or a little more blue. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take just a touch because what I've done is make the world's ugliest purple. Take a touch of my yellow, add it in there. And what that does is it neutralizes the purple. One of the biggest things you're going to learn about color mixing is that to neutralize any color. So basically, I had mixed this color, really dark, kind of a, in the purple because it's red and blue. And then I mixed a tiny bit from across the color wheel and that neutralizes this purple and takes it to hopefully kind of a just a neutral dark. Again, I'll probably have to add a little bit of white to see where that about what, what that kind of underlying color is. And that's a pretty nice gray, still a little bit on the bluish side, but that's actually going to work for us today. So that is a really important lesson. I'm sure most of you kind of knew that or were aware of that. But the big thing is, is if you can think of your colors as constantly on a color wheel, I always have a color wheel up in my studio to refer to. So if I get a color that's too purple and want to neutralize it, I'm simply going to add across the color wheel and that's going to be a little bit of yellow and it brings it and neutralizes it. So conversely, let's say I had an orange that was too bright. Let's just do that really quickly. So mix my yellow and my red and make a nice orange. So 
right? A beautiful, very bright orange. It won't appear anywhere on the sunset. It's too warm, too vibrant. Um, so let's just say I want to neutralize that a little bit, meaning gray it down or brown it down a little bit. I'm just going to take a little bit of the blue, the ultramarine blue, and I'm just going to bring a little bit over here and watch what happens when I mix the orange and the blue together. It goes to gray. Gets grayed down very quickly and uh, much more manageable color. Most all colors in nature do not exist out here. Most all colors, almost everything we're going to paint exists within this color space, meaning that there's at least some mixing from across the color wheel. The world is actually kind of gray and kind of brown compared to what we think. If we paint the world like this, it will look cartoony and uh, really off. You know, there's, that's why we're attracted to flowers and things that are high color is because they stand out compared to the rest of nature, right? Um, so we, we can have spots of these high colors, but for the most part, all the colors we're gonna do exist in this space, meaning that we're mixing constantly across the color wheels and neutralizing down. And so that's what's really great when you have this very, very limited palette is to learn how to make all the beautiful in-between colors. Let's make, um, let's make a green because we talked about that quite a bit. So I'll just grab some blue, some yellow, nice, very, very dark green. Add some more yellow to that. So that starts to brighten up, bring it on the edge here. Right, beautiful greens. In fact, because there's red in this blue, they're a lot more Pacific Northwest. They're a lot more realistic than if I mixed a really high chromatic green. But I can also take in what I was, what Michelle was mentioning that I came around and said, the trees actually have a lot more red in them is watch what happens as I start to invite <laughs> some red into this mix. How toned down and much more piney and naturalistic they look, right? This looks much more, you'll be amazed. I want you to do that this week or this whole semester is when you're going out and observing nature, when you're looking into the greens, think red. And all of a sudden, you are going to be amazed at how reddish things begin to appear to you. And that will be the same, Linda, with you in the desert, of course. You can have lots more reds and oranges. Um, and even in Florida, where the greens are more rainforesty versus the pine trees and stuff here, um, you're going to get, like, I think that within this area here is where a lot of the naturalistic greens are going to live. When we get to a split primary palette where we're two, using two yellows, two reds, two blues, our range is going to get a lot bigger. But what's neat about this palette is that we can do a huge amount still. I like a big palette and I like a clean palette, so I'll just clean off areas here. Something you're going to hear me talk a lot about in my classes, especially in color mixing, is mother colors. Okay, Mother colors are as if we went to the store and showed them our photo reference and said, I need this blue, I need this pinky orange, I need this yellow, and I need this brown, right? Because that's the colors I need for this painting. So mother colors are, we're going to mix, pre-mix a couple of those piles of color. Glass scraper. So I often will paint either from, kind of, or mix my colors kind of from the top to the bottom, or from 
big shapes to little shapes. But a lot of times um, I kind of like to put them like the sky colors would be on the top of my palette and the uh, other colors here. I'm just gonna mix all these dark piles together. I think they're gonna work as kind of a nice dark. All right, so I'm gonna mix my darks in my clouds real quickly, which I'm gonna take some of this dark. And that's already getting close. Um, get some of the white in there. It's a little bit, it's not as dark as my pile. All right, that's pretty close. I'm already happy. So now I'm going to look into my clouds and look kind of for the mid values, the kind of where the clouds getting a little warmer. Oh, a little bit more. Pull some of that aside. Again, that cadmium red is just so unbelievably strong compared to the other colors that I'm having to uh, kind of remember how to use it because I haven't painted with just this palette in a while. So it's a little bit of a growing curve, but I've got this time while I'm mixing my mother colors to play and experiment. And I joke around that I often get so into this color mixing. I apologize, it's really looking quite dark. It's not as dark as it appears on the monitor, um, or at least on my monitor. I'll lighten it up a little bit. I'll push the values a little more. All right, now I've got my mids. Let's go ahead and get into the lighter side of these. Do you um, have um, a sort of set number of values that you begin to look at? Like That's a great question. Thank you. Um, I love if I can keep it in about four values. Three is a great goal, but I, I, I'm rarely that disciplined. So four seems like a good one for me. Um, and let me see if I have any black and white paintings that I don't have color on them. I do do black and white underpaintings a lot. Um, give me one half second. I don't think I have any value paintings. So just kind of how I will often do the beginning of my paintings is like, this is one that I've had sitting around for a little while, but you can see kind of the hints of a, a drawing, but I do it with values. So this is really, really dry. So I can come back in and paint this up, no problem. But I mean, I kind of like it. Um, it's beautiful. These are two that I did in the last class. If you were with me, you know, started them off as black and whites. And then I just glazed in, this one just glazed in red. Um, to create kind of an underpainting. And then I'll go back over the top of this with all my color. And I'll probably do that during this class at some point, just to show you kind of the different steps. So this was started off as a black and white acrylic painting. And then I just put red oil paint over the top of that really transparently and thin. And then this is one that I did with just straight oil paint and just did a subtractive process where I just pulled the paint back off to reveal this. So again, it's just kind of the underpainting that I would use um, I do these different techniques quite a lot just to establish my values. Um, here's one that I did where I established the values the same way, just wiping off the paint. And I liked it so much that I basically left it. I added a little bit of blue in here and tiny hints of some color into the grasses, but not much. It's mostly just the underpainting and the subtractive. This was done on top of a yellow surface. So where it's really quite yellow, is actually the canvas. I just did a yellow mixed with my gesso underneath the painting. So when I subtract, it gets to that. So anyways, lots of different techniques I use. Was that um, an underpainting with acrylic? That one was, no, underpainting with oil. This one so was another one with a red underpainting with oil that I came across it with blues and purples just to cool it down and make it look like it's in a cold fog bank kind of. 
not sure. Hopefully those kind of make sense. We'll go through different ways that we can approach and start paintings um, here soon. All right, now I'm going to look into my yellows, the lighter colors, the lightest value here. This is kind of a cold yellow. I prefer warmer yellows. Generally, I like warm colors when I paint, but, uh, you know, get what you get and you don't throw a fit. So we're going to use this nice coolish yellow. And how can I warm that yellow up a little more? Add a little red. Thank you. Perfect. Gold star for whoever said that. I want to keep the value really quite light, but see how that just gets a little bit warmer than the cool yellow on top? Some yellows are warm and some are cool. Some yellows lean towards green and some yellows lean towards orange. Um, so I took a yellow that wants to lead towards green a little bit there, the uh, Hansa yellow light, and I'm by adding just a touch of red, warming it up. Can you kind of see that compared to the top compared to the bottom of it there? All right. Um, my other color is the blue in the background there. And I'm just going to kind of make a gray down blue that I want to put back there. Grab a little bit of this light. Grab some white paint. I'm also trying to make sure that I'm mixing big enough mother pile, mother color piles that um, that I won't be running out too much. But the great thing is I'm using such a limited palette that if I run out of any of these mother color piles and I need to remix it, I don't have 27 colors that I'm choosing from. I'm not like a mad scientist. I've got a limited palette, which makes mixing and then more importantly, remixing the colors much, much easier. You can make so hundreds, I, hundreds and hundreds of colors with just these three colors in white. Michael, what I'm seeing um, in the painting versus on your palette is like the, the, um, the orange color seems way more vivid than what's in the painting. So what I'm determining is, is that like your colors are all much a higher, hue, a higher chroma than what's in the piece itself. So you kind of predetermine that you need to go higher chroma initially. Is that right? Yeah. And a lot of times my mother colors will be a slightly higher chroma because it's really easy to knock down chroma meaning to make it grayer, like, okay, so let's say this blue is too high of a chroma blue, right? So what color would I mix with this blue to neutralize it just a little bit? By mixing across the color wheel, what would be the opposite of blue? Red. Uh, not quite, close. The orange. Orange. I'll take a little bit of red, orange. just a touch, because it's so strong, and a touch of my yellow. Make a little bit of an orange. And I'm just going to add a dot of it over here and a little bit of this blue and just watch how much, how neutralized that gets. Kind of went a little bit greenish so I can add a little more blue. But it makes it beautiful. Like I'll definitely be able to use some of that in the surf or in the waves or whatever else. So just, you know, looking to, so I will oftentimes have my mother colors be pretty strong, high chroma. That is a great observation and a great question. Um, because again, it's easy to neutralize. The other thing I think about with my mother colors is let's, let's look at this peachy orangey color I've got here, right? So I know that it's kind of going to represent some of these uh, mid values in the clouds or the warmer mids. And I'm going to want that to go towards cool. So the reason it's called a mother color is because now it's got babies and it's going to want to go towards warm. So to make it go towards cool, I just simply pick off a little bit of it and add a little bit of the next shade up. And I've got a slightly cooler version. And when I want it to warm up, conversely, I've just taken or lighten up. There we go. So both of these colors 
are related to the mother. They're both children of the mother, but they're just, this one's a little cooler, darker. This one's a little warmer, lighter, or maybe not even warmer, just lighter. Does that make sense? So a lot of times my mother color will have a whole bunch of children. This is just kind of a small mixing area for me. Um, Michael, I'm, I'm wondering about how uh, this process works with acrylics because it seems like uh, with these oils, you can, you can take the time, you can build these different mother colors and then, you know, have them sitting there while you're painting and then be able to make children with them. But <laughs> yep. with acrylic <laughs> with acrylics it seems like um everything dries so fast i don't i don't know what's your advice on that great all right so this is an acrylic paint box you may have one of these it's basically just a giant tupperware yeah i have one of those okay so and when you bought it it probably came with a giant sponge that went on yeah. the bottom of it that covered the whole thing yeah. I use mine to store my oils. I actually will put this in the freezer at the end of the day, um, much to my wife's chagrin. Um, but if you bought this and left it as it was, it would come with a small, thin sponge that covers the entire bottom of the surface. Right. And then you would put your paper palette across the top of that. So you keep that sponge damp. And then that paper palette will get damp. And that, as long as you're keeping moisture, your paints will stay workable for a very long time. Okay, long that's, that's a great time. point. I, I have one of those and I don't use it. So yeah, okay. <laughs> so the other thing I will do oftentimes is when I'm painting with acrylics, I, let me just grab one here. I don't do it so much and I don't use all my colors. Um, oftentimes it's just black and white or just a dark brown and white. Um, so this is just a transparent um, plastic plate. I buy these by like the 50, you know, whole pack of them. And these are what I use for when I paint with acrylics or sometimes with gouache because I can just throw them away, even though I do reuse them quite a bit. And I'll put my black over here and my white over here. And I will let the bottom have a little bit of water in it. The other tool that's really, really good is a mister. These are um, oftentimes used for uh, spraying um, plants and stuff like that. But it's actually, it's not a sprayer, it's a mister. Meaning it's really That's fine, it's so drips. And I will mist down my uh, acrylics kind of constantly. I'm keeping the tops of them a little bit wet. And I will also mist my painting surface, especially where I want to do blending. And it allows for me to do, you don't want it to get wet and drippy. So it's just kind of a quick mist over the top. And that keeps the paints workable for quite a bit longer. Um, yeah, I'm afraid I can't teach so, so, so much about acrylics, but they also have something called acrylic opens. Yeah, I've seen those. Which are, yeah, much slower dry time. Um, and then, like I said, the water-soluble oils are another option, um, or water-miscible oils. Um, so there's lots of options for you out there. Um, well, thanks. I, I, yeah, I think that those are great suggestions. And if I just used my, my box keeper, um, that would be a big help. Right. Yeah. And then squeezing out a decent pile. It's, I always kind of think of like a, like a snowball melts really fast, but if you make a snowman, it lasts a lot longer, you know what I mean? A bigger pile seems to stay wet longer. Um, and again, misting it. Um, yeah, acrylics are a little more of an active painting because yeah, like I could walk away from this and come back tomorrow and still yeah. use these paints. Yeah. At least most of them. Some colors do dry faster. All right, let's go ahead and start getting some stuff on here. Any more questions about kind of what I did there with the? Uh... The very loose and very quick introduction to color mixing with a very limited palette. When I mix my um, when I add a little bit of paint thinner, I def I only dip like the corner of my brush. 
I do not want a big runny paint thinner uh, filled paint. I don't want to be treating my oils like watercolors unless I do, <laughs> unless it's very specific. But uh, I do find a lot of beginning painters will be like, you know, what's going on? My paint's just running off and dripping and I can't control it and I can't add any more paint on top because it's also slick and wet. Um, so we can keep building paint up and up and up if we go, um, if we build it up fairly dry, we don't want too much paint in there. So I'm just gonna kind of give myself some cloud formation here. I'm not gonna be very particular that it's mimicking exactly the shapes I'm seeing. I often will, for the most part with oils, I will paint dark to light, thin to thick. So my darks will often be a little thinner, meaning I'm not using as thick a paint and I'm spreading them out a little more and, uh, or I'm using a touch more paint thinner. There's two reasons for that. Um, thick, dark paint will dry shiny. And it's kind of a funny thing that where you're painting darks will be very shiny and reflective. And it's kind of the opposite of what you actually want from your painting. So by keeping it thinner, the darks will dry a little bit matter, more matte. And also, I paint from thick to thin, from dark to light. So they, uh, I will be able to apply more paint on top faster by keeping my darks lighter. You, I'm sorry, uh, I don't understand. You said you paint from thick to thin for your thin darks to, only? No, thin, to, thin to thick. Thin to thick, oh, yeah. You ever do a um, a wash over your canvas to get to knock the white down? Yeah, usually. I usually do. Yeah, I prefer that. I, I like having the undercolors. In fact, when I gesso, a lot of times my gesso actually has color. I'll, I'll just mix a little acrylic paint with my gesso, like reds or browns or you know ochres or oftentimes kind of a warm bright yellow. And that's how I, again, I, how I kind of got that um, last thing that I showed you there. The <clears throat> yeah, this painting had a yellow surface underneath. All right, so I went from there. Now I'm going to get to my next kind of value mm -hmm. in my clouds here. And again, I'm going to try to go pretty quickly and we may not do, maybe I'm just going to, okay, here's what we're going to do this week since we're running out of time is we're just going to do two uh, and you can do one or two depending on your time for the week, but I want just a very limited palette, one red, one yellow, and one blue. I'm going to do um, one with, uh, this is a high chroma limited palette. And then I'm going to do another one with a low chroma palette, which is going to be Naples yellow, which is a color I never use. But Naples yellow is kind of a white grayed down yellow. I'm going to use Venetian red, which is a very brown, warm red. And instead of blue, I'm going to use Payne's gray, which is a very gray, kind of blacky, bluish color. I love Hades Gray personally, but it's a, it's an odd color, but, and I'm going to see what can I do with a very limited palette that, you know, I'm not going to be able to mix any colors that match what I'm seeing in my photo probably. And I'm just going to have to not worry about that. I'm going to have to just do the best I can using a very limited palette. We'll see, can we make all those gray down colors still have a little feeling of glow? Not really positive, we'll see. Are you painting on a canvas panel? It is just a piece of wood that I've sanded down and gessoed like three or four coats of gesso. Yeah, it's just a piece of wood. I think it cost me all of like a dollar, you know, plus time. 
And I'm just kind of going from my darks down to my lights. I'm kind of looking at my reference, but I'm kind of not. I'm kind of just looking for interesting shapes and forms that I can kind of grab and mimic. I really, I have the most fun when I use a reference photo to start with and then kind of forget about it. And then I'll kind of get back to it for maybe I need a little bit of like, what would, what would happen here? You know, where's the light hitting here? Um, but just really keeping it very limited values, only a couple colors. And I'm just painting nice and quickly, letting the brush do the work for me. You guys will notice that I very rarely paint like this. We'll talk about this more. But for those of you who want to paint looser, this is how we hold a pencil. And in fact, this is how we write with a pencil. This isn't even how we were supposed to really draw with a pencil. It, this is how we paint, like a conductor or like uh, Michelle's brought up, like Harry Potter, like a wizard, like this is our wand, right? So, and I very rarely paint straight into the painting. Most of the time I'm off to the side of it not only so you guys can see what I'm painting, but because it allows me to change my pressure very quickly and allows the brush to do a lot of beautiful calligraphy very quickly on the surface. You'll see it as I just kind of twist and turn and let my brush dance. Um, I always want to remember that I want this brush to live up to its full potential, right? It's got a flat shape, odd shape. If it was if I wanted just to draw with it, I'd buy one of those brushes that just has the round tip and looks basically like the shape of a pencil. I don't even know if I own any of those because they're so limited in their mark making. By holding the brush like a wand, my medication. we allow it to live up to its potential and make just so many more marks. Okay, you can are you wiping your brush off when you're moving from one other color to the next? I really haven't been very much. You can see I pulled off a little bit on my paper towel, but not much because I'm just kind of slowly getting a little bit lighter. And so, and all the colors are kind of related. I'm just kind of going from the dark of the cloud to the mid of the cloud now to the lighter, warmer of the cloud. Um, but yeah, as, as I get into the sky area that I want much lighter, I'm going to either have to pick up a new brush or I'm going to definitely want to clean it. Um, it is important. One of the notes that I put on the Padlet is about how important it is to, you know, keep cleaning. If you're wanting clean colors right now, I'm not worried about clean colors too much because I'm kind of building a foundation on which to put those colors. So are you using any Gamso now or is it, no, I, I, don't see anything dripping. I really haven't been No. Okay. And the paint's not super thick, but it's not super thin either. Um, and I could have done the background first and put the clouds over the top. That's completely a matter of preference, but I kind of did it this way because I want to show you that it's just shapes. The sky is just shapes. I don't paint from the back forward or from this to that. I'm literally looking, we paint shapes, values, and colors. I'm really just thinking about, um, just what is the bigger, you know, what's bigger, what's smaller, what's, um, I can also use, if I come back in with the sky around the clouds, I can also use this painting to kind of, this part to kind of almost as a carving tool. Um, and I can reshape some of my clouds. I will, if you're, you know, thinking about trees, I can use the sky to kind of come back in and reshape you know, to prune my trees, as it were, to give it form. I can come back in and make sky holes. And a lot of the detail comes by actually going back in to the paint versus just trying to make lots of little marks and preserve them. Yeah, I probably should be cleaning my brush a little more than I am right now, but I'm actually kind of enjoying kind of the muddying of colors a little bit 
And I can come back in and just put another coat of pure color across the top if I feel like I need it. There we go. Starting to get too muddy where I want it to start getting brighter down here. So I will go ahead and wipe my brush off. I could dip it in the paint thinner and do all that. And I'll show you guys that here in just a second because I'm about to get to where I really need it to get quite a bit lighter and cleaner, right? And getting down to the yellows and these pretty colors in the sky here. Before I do, I'm just gonna knock in some patches of that gray, like it's reflecting down into the sand. I'm almost treating this like it's a plain air. Like, uh-oh, I've got to, you know, I got to catch this. This, these, this light's going to change really fast. These colors are going to change really fast. Um, so to clean my brush properly, because this is a very dark, very polluted brush right now, I'm going to take my paper towel and simply pinch and pull, pinch and pull. I want to get as much out of it before I even dip it in the paint thinner as I can. Now I can just give it a quick, let me try not to make you car sick here as I change the camera angle. I've got my little pan here with some paint thinner. I'm going to dip it a couple times, get off the excess, dip it again, get off the excess into my paper towel. And again, that wiping and look pretty much perfectly clean. If it wasn't, I would just repeat, do it again. Um, but I do want a nice clean brush as I approach this last part of my bright and clean colors. So I've got my colors over here. I'm going to go ahead and go towards my oranges. And I'm going to add a touch more red to it because I'm going to go to the horizon line. Wiping it off because I did pick up some of the brown from the clouds above it there, those blues. Um, if your colors are going brown when you don't want them to go brown, that means that you're getting all three of the primary colors into your paint. Which again, if you remember at the beginning, I talked about the fact that I actually do want all three primaries in almost all of my colors. But if it is like an area like this yellow, then I probably want to keep it pretty pure and not introduce, you know, if I introduced um, purple to this yellow, it's going to really neutralize down very quickly. Add just a touch of paint thinner. And that's when I say just a touch, I mean it. It's just literally the corner of my brush barely touching the paint thinner. And that just speeds it up a little bit. It just makes it a little more slick. I sometimes like my paint to be kind of the, the if you think about the drag of the paint as you're pulling it across the surface, sometimes I want a slow drag. So it's, you know, thicker, it's a little more um, sticky, like, a, like, like honey. And other times I want it slick, like oil, like just slides across or like a, a good pen just slides across when you're writing. So you kind of think about that a little bit is, you know, at what point do I want it slicker? At what point do I want it slower? At what point do I want it thicker? At what point do I want it thinner? You saw I just, I was choking up on my brush and starting to use it like this. So I simply just take it and change my grip because that's not where I want to be. Um, if that's going to be something you're going to want to work on and you've been holding your brush like this all your life, all your career, and you want to in, invite more of a calligraphy and more of a looseness to your brush strokes, it's going to take practice. It is not something that's going to come. You're going to constantly be having to remind yourself, like, how am I holding my brush? How am I holding my brush? I had an instructor tell me that um, way back in the day that he should be able to come around and if you just tap your brush like this with his brush, it should go flying out of your hand. It should be a nice loose grip on it. Just kind of dancing in there. A 
and I'm just covering big areas. A lot of times my paintings will just be, I'm just trying to knock in the big shapes, the big values and the big colors. And then if I want to make them more refined, I can. But if like, let's just say I'm outdoors plein air painting, I've got to quickly decide what's the most important thing that I'm chasing. And if, if it's a sunset, it's most likely the light and most likely maybe the clouds in certain, certain states. And so I have to be able to paint fast. And that means I'm going to have to give up something. And that's usually detail. And I just have to go, that's fine. I can either paint that detail in later in the studio or even after dark by just putting a light, I can just kind of make it up. Um, or I can, um, yeah, I just kind of kind of pick. You can't have everything when time is the essence. So is it the color? Is it the light? Is it the mood? Is it the design? What is it that you're chasing? And you kind of got to just go, okay, that's the main thing. I've got some plein air paintings that are literally just patches of color. That there's no like trees, there's nothing. It's just literally how is the sky radiating up from where, you know, from where I see it. Um, and just trying to capture that because I just know that it's going to last all of about two or three minutes. Would uh, you mix your mother um, piles in when you do plain air before the sunsets, like waiting for the I perfect can, time? Yeah, if I can, or at least I'll kind of guess where, you know, because you can kind of tell like, oh, this is going to be a redder sunset or this is going to be that. Um, and a lot of times what I'll do, sunset is much easier for me to paint than sunrise because at sunset, I can go out and I can design. Like, let's say I'm painting mountains and I know the sun's going to set behind them eventually. I can knock in those mountain shapes. I can get in some of the drawing um, in, like I paint Haystack Rock a lot out at Cannon Beach, which is a big, huge famous rock sticking up out, out of the ocean. Um, and a lot of times if I'm doing plain air, I will literally knock that in as big dark shapes because I know it's not gonna move and it's not gonna change. I just need to catch where the light's gonna hit it when it, when it does. So I can kind of figure out my design when I'm painting sunset. When you go out at sunrise, you're starting in the dark and trying to, uh... anyways, um, now. I'll show you now that it's, I've got, got it covered, you know, whether or not it's good or not, it's quite messy, I understand. But now let's see, I can paint from dark to light. I can bring in some of this yellow by simply, I'll just take a grip and I'm just gonna let it skim across the top. And by doing very little pressure, if I push down at all, it'll just blend in and go down into the paint, but by leaving a very light pressure, I can take some of these light colors across the top and let them sit right on top there. What kind of brush are you using? Is that a hog's hair? It is, it's a chunking hog hair um, bristle. It's a flat number six. And I use primarily flats. Um, I just find they're the most versatile. I can make big marks. I can make little marks. I'm going to go again and lighten up some areas here. I am wiping my brush in between here because inevitably as I'm putting lights down on top of these darks, I'm going to be picking up some of that dark color. Do you let your paintings dry in between um, now and finishing? Sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I'm not too worried if they do dry unless 
I've got a big area that I need soft edges. But a lot of times, yeah, I let them dry. In fact, that's what I was doing yesterday was I pulled back out a bunch of paintings that had been sitting around. And I kind of thought maybe they were nearly done. And then I'll just kind of put them on the easel and do, you know, a couple modifications and things. Um, I'm going to scoot this back. And I'll show you what I did with a big one that I think I shared it on the Padlet yesterday. Um, it's a big Italy scene. Um, oh, wrong painting. That's funny. That was Haystack Rock. If you saw it, I don't know if I can let you guys see it. So, this painting was one that I've been working on off and on for a little while. Beautiful. And basically, what I did was I just kind of came back across and re-lit up certain areas across the top one more time. It was um, very atmospheric and moody, and I thought it could be just a little less. Um, and I could, I, so I warmed up the light back here, and then I made it as if that light was coming further forward in the painting. And I really wanted to make these trees that are only being top lit as the light's coming across the top of that hill uh, to really kind of come forward. So yeah, so by revisiting this and basically going through into the lights and into the warm areas that are just kind of being silhouette lit, I was able to just really hopefully re-invite the feeling of a three-dimensionality and atmosphere. Beautiful. Beautiful. Gorgeous. So different, yeah, read. Definitely different feelings. Um, Here's another one that I revisited yesterday, and I, I, I could never quite figure out why I wasn't in love with this one, and it still needs a little more work, but what I realized that my darks up here were the same back here, and that it felt very flat and very claustrophobic and hard to read, so by going back in and lightening the darks and cooling them down, bluing them down, I feel like it feels more like a wet, cold, foresty scene. I'm hoping it's still in progress, but um, anyways, I'm hoping that that makes this, these darks come forward and those darks shadow areas recede back into space a little bit, even though it is a confined space. So yeah, I'm constantly visiting and revisiting paintings. Um, if they come back from the gallery and don't sell, and you know, sometimes I just paint over them completely, but other times you just kind of, see you know what little tweaks could they use to help them read more because unfortunately showing in as many galleries and stuff sometimes the paintings don't get as much time or as much love as i would like to give them i feel like this yellow area is too yellow i think it could go more towards a little bit cooler a little whiter and then I'm going to about call this one just because uh, you can see though, pretty high chroma, lots of color, kind of muddy, you know, didn't clean my brush quite as much as I could have, but uh, it's all right. If this was a plain air painting, I'd be pretty happy. That'd be catching a lot of information really quick in about a half hour. Um, Will you come back and finish this one? And if so, can we see the progress? Uh, sure. I don't know if it's worth revisiting or not. Um, I might just after class just smear it off and reuse it. But um, we'll see. Um, this was more just about an exercise. And, you know, I, I definitely, there's times for practice and there's times for performance. And uh, this is about experimenting, you guys. This is about playing and just trying out new things um not trying to well you know i always want you guys to be impressed but i also want you guys to be like oh look at he's just making a mess he's just having fun he's just putting out paint and trying things playing with different colors that maybe i'm not as used to right now and uh fun 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 if you were to work on it more or if someone wanted to um uh -huh. would you would you kind of keep the brush strokes 
at, as they are sort of more impressionistic or would you sort of blend them a little bit or soften some edges? What do you think? You it's would a hard do? call because for me, um, a lot of times, yeah, you know me, I would probably grab my shop brush and, you know, let's just do it, I guess. I'll do it in the corners here. Right. So especially this blue is really hideous and really um, counter to what I want. And it, isn't it funny that these colors, just red is dark? And now that I have the whole surface color covered, their reading is kind of much more blue mm -hmm. because it's all about, you can't read colors until you get the colors around them. And you can't read colors until you get uh, coverage. So a lot of times I have to get to this point simply so that I can start to read my colors. That's one of the things I err or I'm hesitant when I say, you know, I, I know a lot of teachers who will teach their students to paint like bright red backgrounds. Um, and I oftentimes will paint bright yellow backgrounds, but it's very difficult for beginning students and even for me to judge my colors when they're against that bright, bright color, you know, the bright red background, because everybody thinks Monet did that a lot. Um, you know, having that as a background color and it creates a beautiful vibrancy and a bouncing and an energy, but it's so hard to judge your colors on that. So anyways, let's really quickly just kind of brush some of this out. And oftentimes what I'll do when I have a real textury camp um, image is I will kind of feather out some of the outside images a little bit. See how that just kind of takes some of the focus away from there and all of a sudden it brings it into here. Just little silly tricks of how to focus the eye. We want to keep them out of the corners. So I can just. I do use shot brushes a lot. Um, you know, just looking down at what's on the palette right or on my easel right now. I have all sorts of house painting brushes. I use them all the time. Um, we'll talk about that, but. Um, yeah, and I could come back through, I could feather, I could clean up. I mean, my yellows are quite gray and green and kind of messy. Um, so there's lots I could do to finesse this, but I also kind of like the energy. I kind of like the fact that it actually feels like a real quick plain air painting that I was kind of forced by, you know, mother nature to knock in and knock down quickly. Um, it's such a fine line when you're, going, I want the energy and I want the electricity of a fast painting or a energetic painting, but then I don't want it to be all messy and, you know, wrong colors and stuff. So you guys get to decide what are your, what would you do, Michelle? You think it should be less impressionistic and more uh, refined if it was your painting? Well, because I want to learn to paint looser, that's why I'm asking you, um, because it looks very loose and impressionistic and almost watercolory, at least from sort of the distance of the camera. Um, and so I would have to fight myself not to want to put more detail like in the water. Um, I like the sky and, and you know, just to try to differentiate between the sand and the, um, the, the water. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then you go, okay, if I do want to differentiate my water and my sand, what's the least amount I can do? Like, instead of drawing a fine line all the way around it, which I almost even see in the photo, what's, what are a couple of the more important shadows that I see that will make it look like it's, you know, the, the very, like, you know, quarter inch deep foamy water rolling up on the sand or just maybe even just kind of left on the sand? But not like a wave, even though there's no big waves in this, you know, but not like a this little guy back here. Yeah. And then also you can look at it and go, you know what, these this is a part of my sky is quite a bit darker. So maybe there's quite a bit more dark coming down and into the reflection of the water on this side. But it, it, it is, it's a fine line, Michelle. I'm constantly, you know, just like the rest of you kind of going, oops, shouldn't have done that. It was better, it was fresher before. Um, and you just can't know, you can't beat yourself up too much for going too far because you can't know you've gone too far until you have gone too far. So, you know, I would rather go too far than not far enough more often. 
but that's just me now. You know, there's a lot of times when I'm just like, no, we want it to be what's the very least I can do to get that across. Anyways, there we go. So that's a very limited palette. You can see there's quite a bit of dynamicism and things going on. I hate this cloud right here, this line underneath. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my paper towel and I'm just going to pick up that dark, that paint so that I can come across it. And that's already better. And I'm just going to take the dark away and mix more of the reds and lighter colors. That feels a lot better to me. Oftentimes, um, if you ever did a fast video of me in the studio, you'll see I just pace back and forth from the back of my studio back up. I have to paint standing up for me um, just to get a good sense of, to be able to see the whole surface. Um, I haven't been stepping back. And when I teach, I for some reason forget to step back as much as I would like to. Um, but uh, it's important to be able to see the whole surface. So taking breaks or, you know, getting away from it for a couple minutes can really be invaluable. All right, I'm not doing much of any changes there. Um, so there you go, quick, ended up being a little longer than I hoped. Um, clean that palette off. So it's gonna be two limited palettes one high chroma and one low chroma. So let me squeeze out my low chroma pile real quick. I just got to clean this palette off and let's see, and then we'll be able to put them up side by side and see what kind of a difference we really got. When I'm cleaning up my palettes, I will often just kind of clean up like colors. So like whether it's darks or whether it's cools or whatever, so that when I'm cleaning, I, I'm still making usable piles. Like they'll be just interesting grays. A lot of times I end up with really beautiful colors that I'll go over the top of those other paintings that are just kind of those value studies because I'll end up mixing these really beautiful grays that I find just by cleaning my palette. So let's see what color I ended up with there. So just kind of a nice sandy mm -hmm. color. So just a little note, when you're cleaning your palette, you can save those colors to a degree. What is your palette resting on there? Or do you have it mounted? Yeah, so these arms, these things that are holding the painting, uh -huh. um, normally you would put the painting inside of here behind this front. But what I do is I put screws on the front of them so that I can put a flat, a flat thing on those screws so that the only thing that overlaps is those screws so that I can actually paint most all of the surface really easily. Oh. So yeah, I, that's good. To, yeah. So I just screw those in. It holds the painting in place. I do that with every easel I can. And then the same thing happened over here is with those screws. This is just a big piece of uh, cutting board, glass, plexiglass cutting board, not plexiglass. Um, tempered glass that you get from Bed Bath and Beyond. And then I just paint the back of it gray. And you use the, the smooth side. The other side is the textured side that you would actually use as the cutting board, but the back of it's smooth and it makes a great, a great surface for mixing colors. Interesting. And it's very inexpensive and it has, um, nice and beveled edges so that I'm not cutting myself. If you get tempered glass cut, a lot of times it has really sharp edges. But tempered glass is my favorite mixing area because you can use a glass scraper and a little bit of paint thinner. And if I ever leave it stuck on, what I actually do is take 90 proof rubbing alcohol and put that on there, let it sit for about five minutes and the paint comes right off. Yeah, those alcohol wipes that we that are out because of COVID, you know, those work really well too. 
Yeah, those work great. Otherwise, I just buy. Yeah. Oh, it's 99 ISO Pro alcohol. I just buy these by the box and use those to clean my pellets. They'll last me quite a while. And normally, or oftentimes, you'll see I wear gloves and stuff. Right now, I'm not, but all right. So those of you that are still with me, we've got five minutes left in regular class time, but I wanted to do a quick um, low saturation color palette. So my blue, instead of the ultramarine, this time is a Payne's gray. Let me zoom out. Payne's gray. And this will be almost more like the tonalist paintings we were doing in the class last time, last semester. This is Venetian red, color I don't get to use very often, but sure is beautiful. Very kind of a brick orangey red. Um, mm -hmm. Naples yellow is a color that I almost make fun of because I don't actually understand why people buy it um, because it's basically just white, a little bit of a dirty yellow with a bit of white in it. Um, so for the most part, I try to put out colors on my palette um, when I do my split primary palette are colors that I can't really make, but they can make the most amount of colors. So with these colors, I could pretty much mix any of these colors using my split primary palette. So I generally wouldn't really lay them out unless I was setting a challenge for myself like I'm doing now. Um, there's nothing wrong with them. They're all beautiful, great colors. But like, you know, I, I inevitably have a number of students who will say, oh, I could never paint without yellow ochre. You know, I use yellow ochre all the time. But I can make yellow ochre in a heartbeat. It's, you know, a very, very easy color to make. Um, and you notice when we do the split primary next week, you'll notice I don't have any secondary colors. I don't have any orange, green, or purple because it forces me to make them. So again, we have one color standing in for the yellow. We've got one color standing in for the red. And we've got one color standing in for the blue. And it's a bluish color, a reddish color, and a yellowish color. But nobody's going to ever you know, walk by and say, boy, those are bright. <laughs> those are high chroma. Those are, you know, so you can do the same thing. This time, I'm just going to kind of attack it because of time. And I'm not going to do a whole lot of the pre-color mixing. And I don't even know what these colors are going to do when I mix them together. But I'm just going to be chasing kind of the feel. I, I know I can't make these pure colors. So I'm just going to kind of chase the feel of them and get the shapes, some of the values. Oops, breaking my own rule. Where's that horizon line, Orwick? So my goal is to still get it to be vibrant and beautiful in its own right, but it's not going to be dependent on high chroma. It's not going to be dependent on really strong color. So in this case, I'll have to play more with the limited temperature shifts that I'm going to get and more on the value shifts that I'm going to get. And you see how I'm just, it's very abstract, right? It's a Rorschach test of a painting so far. You know, what the heck is that? I don't know. But I'm not thinking, hopefully, too much of things or anything. It's just shapes and values. I'm using a pretty big brush right now. So again, it's a size, I don't know what it is. Been, oh, size eight. It's a pretty big brush on a little canvas here. I just want to get it covered, just like we did last time. Mm. 
and I don't even know if I've got any students left, if everybody had to leave for lunch, but uh, for those of We're you here. still We're here. here. Everybody's here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I apologize and I appreciate you guys being able to uh, stay a little bit longer. And if you're watching this in the recording, don't worry. I don't, I'm not mad that you had to leave. I get it. This class is going long. We just had a really nice get to know you session at the beginning. And uh, I think that was very valuable. And, you know, at least I want to get to know all you guys. So, um, great. We didn't want you to talk to yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you couldn't stop me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, at the end of this movie is where I find out all of you are actually in my head this whole time. <laughs> yeah, right. That, that's right. <laughs> so my horizon line appears a little bit crooked, so I'm just going to quickly measure that. So it's four inches pretty much exactly, and four inches pretty much exactly. All right, good. Just standing off to the side of it. Normally, I'd be standing in front of it, but when I'm demoing, or class with a video camera. Of course, the camera gets preference. So it's mm -hmm. always a little bit of an interesting remembering how to paint to the side of my painting. Hmm. Got this beautiful little warm color, but actually I'm gonna gray this color down a little bit first and see. I can play up some of that transition in the clouds with value before I go straight to temperature. Maybe get a little lighter, I feel. Maybe a touch of the warmth into there as it's... And, and what motivated you to do that? I'm just, just looking at the transitions in the clouds and it doesn't go just from dark to, to or from cold to warm. There's a transition in it um, where it gets a little bit lighter and a little tiny bit warmer. So I just thought, you know, maybe it'll help me give a little more form to these mm. clouds then. So it, previously my um, cadmium red was by far and away the strongest pigment. And now I'm really noticing how strong this uh, Venetian red is. And you guys don't need to use Venetian red if you're, if you're wanting to play along and do any of these exercises. Any kind of a brownish, reddish color would work, or you could use orange, I don't care. Whichever color you want to use as a stand-in for red, but I'm just showing that I can use other colors as stand-ins. And a lot of times I really, really enjoy challenging myself by taking away my blue and only using black, or by taking away my yellow and only using um, like an ochre or something like that, because you get these beautiful earthy tonalist kind of style paintings. Um, so again, if you were with me in the last session, you've seen me do some of this, and I've already forced some of this upon you as uh, brutal lessons, but sure is fun, and was sure neat seeing a lot of your guys' results last term. So I'm mixing that, but look at how bright that is. Like if I put that on here, it's just gonna be really too, right. too strong, too garish. So gotta kind of gray that down a little bit at least. And And I'm not copying the clouds exactly. Um, well, of course I'm not. But, um, you know, I'm just trying to capture the essence, the idea. And in fact, the night I took these pictures, there was actually a guy plain air painting down the beach from my wife and I as we were sitting on the beach. And I got to know him and uh, got invited next time I go to Maui, which we already signed back up because we had such a good time um, to go again next year. Um, I'll get in touch with him and go out painting. So next year, I'll actually take my paints with me or just use some of his. He said he had a number of setups. So that's always fun. There's that, there's that camaraderie right away. We actually 
had a lot of mutual friends and stuff from mainland side and stuff. So pretty fun. And I think you'd actually seen some of my videos on YouTube, which is kind of funny. He was also a nurse. So evidently nurses make good painters. You need to relax after the stress of taking care of people. Right. I can only Seriously. imagine. I need to relax after the stress of just trying to take care of myself. I can only imagine. How pretty that color is in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's quite nice. I like it? this red. This is beautiful. Yeah, um, I was going to use the transparent earth red, you know, which is my fate, one of my favorite go to colors, but I decided that was a little bit playing it safe for me because that, that color is on my palette often. So I decided yeah. to use this, um, this Venetian red, which I know is gorgeous. I mean, look, I'm just going to mix it with just white. And it's so pretty. It's beautiful. Such a nice color. Yeah, my friend Amy Erickson does quite a few paintings where she plays with Venetian red. And I just love, I love them. Let's do a black and white gray. And then just mix some of that Venetian. And it's just this nice, beautiful muted color. So fun, you know, and we wouldn't know that if we weren't allowing ourselves to play and experiment and try new things. Because there's, you know, uh, there's something so great about using this split primary palette that I'm going to talk to you guys about in the next upcoming classes because of the repetition, because I can understand it. But there's also, you've got to make time to play and to try different colors and to substitute out. You don't have to have a whole new palette. You can just substitute out, substitute out one color at a time or just invite what I call one guest color at a time. And that way you understand 90% of your colors, but you're inviting one chaos agent. And uh, it's super fun to just see what happens, how that works. And in fact, some of my guest colors, my quin uh, quinacridone red made its way onto the permanent palette a long time ago. And then Indian yellow has snaked its way in and took away my cadmium yellow medium. So it's interesting when you have these guest colors, you kind of discover, oh, you know, they do this and that and this, and I really like it. And it makes my work a little different from everybody else's palette. And uh, the colors are a little bit my own. And uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to offer up a limited split primary palette, but I am going to suggest that you treat it just like a beginner, just like a, this is a suggested palette. And eventually I'm going to make this palette into my own by simply experimenting, by substituting out. But I generally think it's a good idea to keep two reds, two yellows, two blues, whatever colors you choose. Um, because you can control your mixing. With the three primaries right now, it's much easier to mix your, to control your mixes. And then with two primaries of each, it's a little more complicated, but it's way easier. And you know, most of my students, when they come to me, literally are just kind of squeezing out different colors every time they paint. There's like, well, there's, you know, some browns in here. I guess I better have some browns or some, you know, oranges, I squeeze out a little orange. And I just find that to be really difficult. You're never really understanding the colors that you're using. You're just never giving yourself a, a, enough time. It takes that they're, they're so nuanced. And so, you know, and every time you mix it with a new color, it's a whole different chemical reaction basically happening. And so anyways. And it's exciting to the brain to use different colors and and see the the combinations how how they complement and I just love what you're doing and color is so fantastic. Oh, thank you. Agreed. Right. 
You like tonalism too, so. I do, I love this one. <laughs> Right. And for some of you, they're going to be like, oh, my gosh, it's so, you know, it's so limited. It's so um, it's not saying as much as it could. Right. It's not singing with its full octave range. But for others of you, you're going to be like, oh, I really love the restraint. And I love that it's, you know, staying within a within a certain key. Um, there's a harmony to that. And neither one is right, neither one is wrong. And sometimes I feel like painting with lots of color. And other times I feel like painting with very subdued uh, range of colors. It's funny that you use the word key and harmony because color is like music. It's so, it's so just, I don't know, elusive and, and uh, and the morning light, the midday light, even three o'clock and two o'clock, the colors are different on the landscape. Oh, it's yeah. just oh, amazing. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I like to try to think of them musically or poetically or different, you know, a lot of times I'll be using movie terminology like uh, camera um, terminology, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. And then the whole idea of the keys, I think we talked about that quite a bit in the last class about high key paintings and low key paintings and um, everything else. And uh, yeah, that definitely, you know, this is a much quieter painting than the one I did previously, probably. We'll see how it ends up. <laughs> My horizon line's got a little bit of a slant to it there just by that last line I left. We are, we are walking around on a ball and it's okay to see the curvature of the earth. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I think I'll probably subdue it a little bit. Let's see, it should be just a simple dragging the brush across and reintroducing a little bit of a where's that? Try and get the last of my clean white. But this is beautifully messy. It is just, I don't even, I didn't even mean that as a compliment, but it's, it's, it's messy. These are weird, broken brush marks. I'm just kind of putting things down. But when I look up at the monitor, it's pulling together, sort of. And I kind of like, like it, that it's got sort of a sense of energy. Again, just trying to get everything covered. This painting is about the colors, about just a limited primary palette and a or a, a, a muted primary palette and a vibrant primary palette. You can choose the colors you want. 
If you're only going to have time for one, I would prefer that it's the stronger colors, probably. Um, but if you have time to do two paintings or want to push yourself and experiment, um, then please do. They're both beautiful. All right, Ryan. Love Mm -hmm. Lights would we'll have to just reload these, but I'm just going to see if I got enough just to, to. It's too cold. That white really comes across as very cold when it's just by itself. And let's see if I can get a bit of a wave, which means I need to get back to the darks. Just to make it a little bit interesting here, we'll just kind of bring it across. A bit of a dark and back across. Huh. Gorgeous. Thank you, thank you. And a couple, just to figure out again where the where that water's rippling along. What's the least amount I can say? What's the least amount of words or brush strokes that I can use to say the most? I just want this transition to be a little bit better. Whew. Got some odd brown up in there. All right. Crazy, messy, and I could come back in and I could lighten the bottoms of the clouds. But what I want to do now is just simply put them side by side. A little higher. And there we go. So you can see, isn't that interesting how this does almost read as bluish a little bit, even though there's no blue in this painting? Mm -hmm. Red yes. still has somewhat of the same kind of feel and stuff, but um, yeah, gorgeous. So we don't we don't need so 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 much high chroma to get across a lot of our what we're trying to say, but chroma sure can help and it definitely does make color mixing easier. Like I couldn't mix a purple with this, right? Because it's, it's, you know, mm -hmm. I couldn't mix any really great clean colors, but because they're, you know, by themselves, our brain starts to make them feel like blues, purples, reds, oranges, even though that's not really what we're seeing. I always find that to be so interesting. When we do the Zorn palette, you'll really see how the blacks will read as blues when you don't have any other blue on the surface. I mean, quite literally, people will swear up and down you've used blue in your painting. Such a strange thing. Anyways, thank you guys. I apologize that we didn't do the third painting, the split primary, but I think that's actually going to be a great break. Is that that way next week I'm not over inundating everybody. And next week we're going to. I'm going to introduce the palette that we'll be using mostly. But this is kind of a quick history lesson of how I came to use the colors that I use. makes all flows and stuff, but Great. not any not questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Is any wow, home? Is, is, just, is any homework that we have to do? Like we should be copying. I mean, we should be doing one of those paintings like you did for us. I, um, so I want you to do at least one painting. Okay. With, um, but it doesn't have to be, um, it does not have to be like that same picture that I chose by any means. Okay. Um, if, but if you want to, if you're just like, oh, you know what? I just want to jump in. That's there. I'll use it. Um, what I, so any picture you want. Okay. Um, but I'm just asking that you do a limited palette, a very limited. So one red, one yellow one blue and white. Yes. You can choose what those are. Okay. If, you're, if you're only going to do one painting, mm -hmm. 
if you're only going to do one, please do a higher chroma. Yes. Meaning the French ultramarine or something like that, not the not the gray. But if you're right. going to do two, then I would love to see you do a low chroma version as well. Okay. And they can be as fast and as abstract and you know as messy <laughs> as you want. I don't care. But if you want to do them bigger, that's fine. Um, for so for most all of our homework, I hope that you'll do it. Mm -hmm. it will help if we kind of keep working and progressing but if you miss it if you know life gets in the way or whatever i don't it don't don't worry about doing that assignment before you do the next assignment i would rather you just jump back into the class so let's say you don't do this week and next week i introduce split primary palette just skip this painting and go to split primary palette i don't care um you, the good news is you all have a pluses already so <laughs> you've all um, passed thank um, you yeah, so I will just give as much or as little homework as you want to do. Um, I will promise you, though, those of you that do the most work will learn the most and um, come away with the most from this. So it really does show the people that paint the most um, win. Okay, thank as, you. As far as learning, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, guys. Thank I really you. appreciate you spending so two thank you. hours, three minutes. You guys are awesome. What a group. All right, thank you. I look forward to seeing what you share on Padlet. You guys take care. Thank you. I, I, have, a, I have a quick question, Mike. Of course. Um, I only signed up for today. How do where do I go to sign up for the the, the whole package? Uh, the whole you would contact OSA again. And if you actually call them, I think that they because otherwise it'll be more expensive. To sign up day by day, but if you just tell them, "Hey, I've changed my mind. I'd like to sign up," I think they can prorate it so that you'll get the cheaper, cheaper rate for all the classes. Okay, thank you. Great, that makes me feel good. I impressed you enough. I uh, didn't scare uh, you away. Good. Not at all. Oh, good. Thank you, guys. I'm really looking forward to this. This is obviously going to be a really great dynamic group filled with nurses, and uh, <laughs> it's going to be fantastic. And nurses and seagulls. All right. <laughs> All right, everybody, take care. We'll see you guys next week. Bye.